we'd like to thank our show sponsor, Optio. Optio is a Google Ads management tool and much more. If you run one Google Ads account or 100, Optio will save you time and enhance your ad management skills. Smart, powerful and built to make life easier. It will automate routine Google Ads tasks and alert you automatically to trends and even make automatic recommendations. You can then spend more time on high level strategy and creative work. We use Optio in our agency to make us more efficient and effective. Go to optio.com forward slash click and convert to claim your six week free trial. That's optio.com forward slash click and convert to claim your six week free trial. This is the Click and Convert podcast, bringing you the latest marketing techniques used on the world's leading online platforms, including Google, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Here's your host from online marketing agency, Clarks and James, it's Sean Clark. And welcome to the Click and Convert podcast. Uh, I'm Sean, your host Sean, and um, back again. So we're coming up to the silly season now. We're in October and we'll be encroaching on uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Um, all of that silly stuff is coming up very soon. So today's guest is probably quite relevant to that area. Although I must say, if you haven't got your stuff in place by now for Christmas. You are well behind. Um, you should have been planning this back in the summer, but ah, you know, you know what it's like. We all get busy doing other things. Anyway, uh, today's guest is Josh Ramsey, a fractional CMO and digital marketing executive who works with companies to help them map out a more robust marketing strategy. Josh is a Google partner and owner of a digital marketing agency, brings nearly 30 years of sales and marketing experience to his role as a fractional CMO for companies looking to dominate their competition across every advertising medium. Uh, When he's not directly coaching his clients or hosting his own radio show, Josh travels the country teaching his marketing strategies and methods that have been proven year after year. He's also got uh, a background in coding, uh, done some masterminding, has marketing and sales programs. In the last 10 years, Josh, you've been a busy, busy guy, built a CRM system, an operations management program, website audit programs, and the world's largest, I hope you can clarify how you measured this, library of SEO descriptions. Um, and you've got a book coming out, which we will also talk about shortly Uh, welcome to the show josh hey thanks for having me how's it going today yeah it's great thank you very much um you've been busy guy in the last 30 years there's uh it's been a wild ride but it's been it's been fun i've enjoyed it so 30 years in this business you must have seen a, a lot of changes yeah, I think only about once a year do I see something that's a little bit wonky, <laughs> and uh, and it's always fun to figure it out. But uh, but yeah, I mean I've I've dealt with just about every industry. I think the most interesting industry is I wrote an uh, entire marketing campaign for a company that sells pads for psychiatric hospitals. So the wall pads that go in those. Oh, pads. those pads, not not writing pads. <laughs> no, no, the actual wall pads, so that people mm. don't hurt themselves. That was a that was a fun campaign, maybe the most interesting one. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Um, <laughs> so the term fractional CMO. Uh, what does that actually mean? So companies have a hard time growing, and they yeah. oftentimes hit a plateau of growth. And what happens is they work with an agency or they hire the average marketing person to come into their company to help them get to the next level. But at some point, they hit a wall with that person or that agency where it's not robust enough. They don't have a bigger picture. So they need a high level marketing mind that will take them to that next level. So. What I do is I like working with companies that are in that that spot and they're trying to figure out how can we jump, but they can't quite afford the highest level chief marketing officer. 
So they're looking for someone to come in, oversee what they're doing, maybe revamp their system or hire better marketing people or train their staff and kind of get a fresh perspective on what's going on uh, so that they can better adjust their systems and grow their company and, and move beyond that plateau that they've been stuck at. So you're basically, basically um, helping them make the right decisions when it comes especially to online marketing. It's, it's not always, it's not just about the right decisions, but yeah. yes, that's one way to look at it, right? So it's, it's about, if you go off of making the best decisions, absolutely, but it's not just focusing on one element of lead generation, it's the full picture. But your online presence has got to be there because no matter where you advertise, they're going to look online. They're going to look at your reputation. They're going to look at your website. So that is a core fundamental staple that has to be paid attention to. Yeah. And, and as we know, this uh, this sector, especially the online digital sector, has so many different, uh, should we say, skill sets now. Uh, you know, there was a time when you'd you, you could be a web designer and that would mean that you did coding, uh, that you did UX, uh, all sorts of things. You got uh, involved in analytics, whereas now it's, it's actually a lot more broken up. So it makes it much more difficult to, uh, you know, just to build a website in the first place. So how do you how would you go about building an effective website? Where, where do you actually start with something like that? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. And I think a lot of people get lost when it comes to building a website and they don't even realize it. So what I always tell people when I teach conferences is I tell them, close your eyes for a minute and I want you to identify and picture a type of person. And that person is going to be a designer. What do they look like? What, how do they dress? What environment do they thrive in? And then once you have that picture, let's look at a second person. And we call that person a coder, someone that puts together the technology of the website. And what does that coder look like? What do they thrive in? What environment do they love to thrive and work in? And how does their brain work? How do they dress? And then when you open your eyes and you compare these two individuals, oftentimes you're going to see that they're two very different people. The designers are kind of bright, bubbly type people. And the best coders are people that want to work at nighttime. They want to work in a dark room and just put their head down. They don't want to talk to people. They just want to work on a computer. And where I think that even if you identify these two, probably the largest area that people miss is someone that is in between these two people. And that person is what I call the strategist. The strategist is the one that helps you write content, that understands your goals, that understands how the user experience of design with your goals and call to actions get placed by a coder properly. And then making adjustments along the way, that strategist ends up being the most critical piece of building your marketing, specifically website marketing. And therefore, when people don't understand what a strategist should be and what they should do, they essentially have a hard time growing their online brand. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I get that. I mean, companies especially get so caught up in the tactical elements of a website, the functionality when actually if you tailor it for your audience um the, the actual functionality becomes quite secondary because you've already got the buy-in there already um so what are your thoughts about using sort of straightforward simple programs off the shelf you know the likes of uh, GoDaddy's uh, platform builder or one on one i think it's got a different name now i honest um you know they've they've got self build website platforms within them um you know everything from basic couple of pages now up to full e-commerce offerings what what's your thoughts on things like that i think for startup companies it works well when you're just getting started and we don't have a large budget to work with working with those simplified programs can do you some good but essentially they become a 
business card online. People need to know who you are to be able to Google your name and hopefully you're found. Although sometimes that doesn't happen. And that leads to a problem when you're trying to rank for specific keywords, for words that are more commonly searched. And that the, the programs like a GoDaddy or one-in-one type program, they just limit you. Primarily, I would say there are a lot of markups, like schema type markups. We've identified about 15 to 20 different types of markups. And every day, these markups continue to increase. So when you look at doing search markups versus local uh, organic markups for schema to help Google's code identify what you're trying to rank for, a one-in-one or a GoDaddy builds simplified markups and they're not very in-depth. That's just how they're built. Uh, So when you get away from that GoDaddy, it actually does a lot more for you. And I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that working with a platform such as a commonly used program called WordPress, you can do a lot of the same thing that you're doing with GoDaddy, but it can be a little more effective in the long run, especially as you look to optimize as your company grows. Uh, There's a lot more options that you have when you work with a different program like a WordPress type platform. Yeah, I I mean, just to explain for those not familiar, but markup is just little bits of code that you can wrap around, say, an address to tell Google that this is a street, uh, this is a city, uh, this is a province, this is a a postcode or or, or whatever it happens to be, like a telephone number, and it helps Google um, uh, actually integrate those into their search, especially at a local level, better. Uh, One of the interesting things you said there about about WordPress, um, one-on-one, they, they've actually released a, a system now where you can actually launch a whole WordPress site from within their back end, which is quite cute. So you can take you can take that next level step um, without having to go through the, the whole install thing, which is which is quite cool. But as you say, um, the the SEO limitations can be quite large on the on the um, on the off the shelf um, type type platforms. So talking about channels. I mean, we, we, you've touched on a number of times about SEO and you said about, um, you know, you've got the a large library of SEO descriptions, etc. cetera. Um, do you, I mean, where do you put SEO in terms of priority for, uh, for most clients? Typically it's going to be second or third. The, right. the first one is going to be goals. Okay. What, what are you really trying to achieve? And then the second one would be more of the process that you have once someone enters your system, once they identify themselves as a prospect, whether it's qualified or unqualified, but they've entered your educational spectrum, then you need to identify those two items almost at the same time. And then you start looking at SEO. You look at lead generation versus your general strategy. So where, where, where do you put SEO against uh, sort of paid advertising and email marketing? Where, where, where do they all layer together? So again, it becomes goals, but essentially okay, they, can, yeah. they can run together. They run at the same time. I, I think many times I find ad agencies that they're running paid ads and they're running organic work, organic being SEO. But what happens where agencies fall off is that they don't have those two departments working together. See, when you run paid ads, there's search terms that you can identify that people are typing in to find your ads. And whether you show up or not, you can still get that information from paid ads. But the paid department, the the department of an agency that runs paid ads, they oftentimes don't share those search terms with the organic side, the SEO side. And if they did, then the SEO side should be writing a lot of content around those terms. Because a lot of times they become what's called long tail keywords. And as long tail keywords, those are the easiest ones to rank for. Thus, commonly overlooked. But those are words that you want to pay attention to because you can draw a 
you can draw a small amount of traffic, but if you rank for them and you're driving that traffic and you find, say, eight or ten of those keywords, all of a sudden you have eight or ten long tail keywords and you're equaling the amount of traffic that one bucket keyword would be generating for you. And, and how would you set expectation, especially for the smaller businesses out there in terms of, uh, of SEO? I mean, it's, it, um, you know, in some competitive areas, you know, it can, it can take an awful long time to, to, to make a mark. Um, and I, I, I don't know, um, where, where, where do you sort of say, well, don't expect to see any results for two to three months, six to 12 months? Did, do you see any of that or do you think you should start to see the telltale signs early on? Yeah. Within 30 days, you should really start to see really? some, some type yeah. of money. Yeah. And, and some of that's kind of twofold. One of it is you need to know what they're doing day to day and how they're doing it. Um, you know, I, I, when I interview people to do any type of work, I ask them what their day to day is. And I ask them, to give it to me in specific detail. Don't tell me, oh, I worked on this code and I optimized this and I worked on this site to get them ranked. No, tell me how you did that. Like what type of work did you do? Did you write meta keywords? Did you implement them? Did you look at the tag cloud? So some people say, well, meta keywords are non-existent. It's actually not true because meta keywords are written into your meta description and title and they also are on page words, thus leading to a tag cloud. So then people say, well, tag cloud was taken off search console. Not really, because a tag cloud carries weight, which is also known as density. So now let me circle back to your question. You can identify those long tail search terms through keyword research. By understanding those long tail keywords, they are easily rank, rankable, if that is a word. That yeah, we yeah. So as we look to rank there, we can start to see traction. I use a program that allows me to see in a bar graph the keywords that a company is ranking for, and it allows to show me from position number one to position 100. And within that, I can see either a green arrow or a red arrow. And if we watch this movement within 30 days, some of your lower ranked words can start to move up within 30 days. If you apply the correct SEO based on the website, your marketplace and other various factors, but a good company, a solid company that's doing SEO should be able to give you some results in 30 days. May not be what you expect, but that, thus set your expectations properly, set those goals before you hire somebody, and then track those goals prop, you know, in, in specifics. I mean, do, do you have sort of guidelines for how much content should be being written on a daily weekly monthly monthly basis i mean i know there's a lot that can be done on the technical side of seo but once once that's done um you know is there a specific amount of content that people should be knocking out if you like yeah i mean again great question i think you start with the core and your core has to be built well right <laughs> I, I don't work out as much as I should, but when you talk about working out, you always start with your core. You go to a trainer and they say, let's work on your core of your back and your abs and you know what really holds your framework. And you would be blown away. I was shocked a couple of years ago when I read this figure. Uh, according to some, some very uh, high level researchers, 89% of websites have at minimum one page that's what's called low text to HTML ratio. So low text to HTML ratio means you have a certain amount of code on a website and you don't write enough content for that page. So when you have low text to HTML ratio, it doesn't matter if your website is say 500 pages. If five of them or 10 of them or 20 of them have low text to HTML ratio, you're essentially shooting yourself in the foot. So continuing to write content for that website thus becomes to a degree obsolete. 
So you have to start with the core of what are your core pages? What pages do you already have? And do you have enough content on those? Then next step is the content directed well. Then yes, the answer to your question is, you know, uh, depending on your industry and the content that you can write, I would say if you're publishing at minimum one new page a month, then you're doing all right. I mean, obviously you can do more, but I think you set your your goals that you can achieve to begin with, and then you work from there and grow from there. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. So, um, you know, if we've if we've built up or building up this content, you know, one of the other things um, that gets talked about a lot is is link building, uh, link acquisition, outreach, uh, those those type of things. Um, you know, where, where do you see that sitting, you know, once you've built your content in terms of building the authority for, for a site over time? Yeah. Link building is, is important. However, it's extremely hard to do it right. Um, the most credible links that you can drive to your site are ones that are from sites that carry a heavy amount of authority. So when you think authority, the first thing is we don't have enough time to walk through what the authority is, but you could, you know, your, your listeners can Google that and identify what authority website looks like and what it is. But essentially you want to start with websites linking to you that carry heavy authority. Some of the sites that carry the most authority are going to be .edu's. Because the .edu's are going to be universities, schools. Another one is going to be .gov. Because .gov's, again, carry heavy authority. And and if they're linking to you, there's a reason for it. So let's say that you're a medical company and you get a .gov. Then there's probably an article on that .gov that you have earned enough credibility that they're linking to you. If you're just trying to link or what's called a link wheel, if you're, say, an ad agency and you're just doing a link wheel where all of your clients are now pointing their website to you, that oftentimes can become a spammy type of SEO and link building. So link building you have to be very, very careful with, but mainly earn right content to earn credibility And that credibility, when you submit that through, you can do programs like PR Newswire. When you build that credibility and you have a well-written website, then you submit that to different organizations and try to earn those links. And when you earn those organic links to your site, that's when linking really becomes effective, thus showing authority to your website, thus improving your rankings yeah so when, when we get down when we get down this deep so we've already spoke about the technical side the design side um linking writing content i mean to me that's four people before i've even got started um so that that immediately screams small business needs agency how how does a small business qualify um, a, a, an agency that can actually provide, I mean, more importantly, uh, you know, providing the right service at the right cost, I think, because, uh, you know, there are many agencies out there that do an absolutely brilliant job. And they really, really do. They win awards every month. Um, they highline with all the, all, all the top brands. Um, but, um, y- you know, the, the small business just can't afford that that bill and they can't afford yeah. to hire a person in house so where, where where do they get the balance <laughs> not to waste their money yeah the, again such a awesome question and sometimes hard to answer because i go back and i use the word a lot goals and it really does come first of all to your goals what are you trying to achieve and are they achievable because different goals you know for a billionaire is going to be one Uh, versus a small business owner that's typically not a billionaire and they have a different budget. They don't have a, you know, um, Amazon or Starbucks or McDonald's type budget. So you have to look for agencies that 
and, and feel free to kind of guide me down a different path if I'm not answering your question, but you really want to start with, with agencies and understand what makes them relevant. Because at the end of the day, agencies have a specialty. They have a certain amount of people and a process of how they handle SEO. And, you know, I, I always tell people, you ask five different agencies strategy on how to better your website and you're going to get five different answers. Yeah. And sometimes it's not necessarily that they're lying to you or they're deceitful. I think there's definitely probably two or three in that group of five that are, they are, they are not doing very good and they're a little bit shady. But at the end of the day, when you, when you do find the legitimate companies, the agencies that are working for you, it becomes experience, strategy, and opinion on why they would recommend and identify for your website, for your company, the best tactical moves uh, to increase your, at the end of the day, business owners, we care about one thing, making more money. Yes. So to a degree, we don't care as business owners how we get there. We rely on quote unquote marketing individuals to help us get there to generate the leads so that our salespeople can close more leads. So, when you're trying to find an agency, you're really looking for them to generate leads, not necessarily close the sale. Uh, so that has to be your first goal. But then understanding their strategy is is the next part. And then going back to budget, it's such a tricky question. At the end of the day, if you want to spend two to five hundred dollars, typically what you're going to find is it's a one man outfit. It's one or two people that are working together, that started an agency together, and that's where you can afford it. When I started my ad agency 10 years ago, I had a $200 and $500 program, and I charged more than that on some clients. I had some clients that were paying $2,500 a month uh, when I started out, and those were my big clients. Now they're considered average clients for me as far as the scale goes of revenue to my company. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what some companies pay, but if you are going to pay two or 300, uh, you can get something good out of them, but you again need to set the goals, realistic goals and know what they're doing and how they're going to do it. And thus you can get good information. I, I have a program that I created for small businesses that charges $350 a month but they don't have a project manager. They don't get to call in and have a lot of conversations, but it helps them grow and it gives them a good baseline program that they can work off of. And it, it gives them something of value so that they can grow. I like to help small business owners as much as I can simply because I was one at one point in time. So I like to help people that are trying to help themselves that are really working hard, but frustrated with the marketing world. Um, thus I, I do a radio show and I do a podcast like yours and I, I publish a lot of marketing material, uh, just to try to help those business owners that are really struggling. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. I mean, you know, one of the things that's always frustrated me about this industry is that it's lack of qualifications. I mean, if it was the financial services um, uh, sector, you know, it's almost like it was back in the 80s. Um, for financial services when there was very little uh, restriction on what could be sold and couldn't be sold. And, 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 and I feel we're still like that, especially with the online marketing side. The development side, I think, is growing up quite, quite quickly. But the online marketing side, it's so easy to read a book and then think you know how to do SEO or Google ads or Facebook ads. Um, you know, and some people get lucky and they really are good at it. But there's a lot that aren't. Um, and that, that really frustrates me. How, how, how do you, I mean, you need to get in and out of those situations quite quickly. You know, how, how, do, how do you identify that as a small business that actually you're not talking to the right person or agency because the small business owner, to be quite frank, isn't going to have that, that knowledge to make that decision a lot of the time. Yeah. So, so. I'm going to go ahead and throw out just so so people have an option is I talk to a lot of business owners on a monthly basis and I give them free advice. Um, 
you know, I, I help them as much as I can. I can't obviously spend hours upon hours without a coaching program to help them through that. I do have a baseline coaching program, like you kind of alluded to, uh, that I work monthly with business owners to help them identify, are they working with the agency? Is the agency doing their job? But for free, a lot of times I just talk to business owners to try to mentor them enough to get them on the right path. Um, so, you know, it's, it really comes down to experience. If people know a marketing person in their life, getting opinions can help, but you need to be clear on perspective of what that opinion is. I'll give you a perfect example. Last week I had a client call me and they got a evaluation from another agency saying that, uh, some of the people that work for me weren't doing their job. So I sat down and I identified what the other agency said, and I identified what my my team had been doing for them for the last eight months. And what I came back with was the entire foundation of the website that was just built and launched less than eight months ago. The, the site was actually launched three months ago. All of the groundwork was there and the other agency never identified that all of this work had been done. They only identified what hadn't been done. And I looked at it and I looked at the business owner and I said, of course they're pointing to what hasn't been done. Look at our plan for the next three to six months and 90% of what they're saying we should be doing is on our next three to six month plan. So I said, you know, let's not lose our minds thinking that things aren't done. If you really want to know, go back to that agency, take this list, which I gave them and said, here's what we've done. Take this list and go back to them and ask them, are these things completed? And they're going to tell you, yes, unless they're lying, because I can show you specifically every element that I'm sharing with you of completed tasks. Um, so that's where you can kind of identify and be careful when you're talking to people, because again, you you don't, you don't want to get taken for a ride, but when you don't know what to ask, then it becomes a problem. One more quick story. I'll tell you, I had a client come to me. They worked with another agency for several years. They worked with me for one year. I looked at their analytics. Analytics are basically, it's a free tool from Google and it tells business owners what it is. Uh, visitors information. So people that come to your site, how they get to your site. When I looked at the general audience, we were down 90% in traffic year over year. So when I looked at that, I kind of panicked a little bit. I said, did we really screw up over the last 12 months? But then I started diving in. And what I found was the fake traffic, the referral traffic that was coming to his site in the previous year was being generated from spam bots. So these are programs that you can pay a few bucks a month to, and they will drive traffic to your site. So it looks like you're increasing on traffic, but when you look at the referral, you can see that it's uh, it's coming from other sources like xyz.com, and thus you're really not driving organics. And that's really what you need to pay attention to is your acquisition of organics to see what happens. So again, those are two quick case studies of, of items and elements that, that I track um, to, to help you know identify where companies are going and why. Yeah, it's a good point on the analytics. Uh, Google Analytics is, uh, is such a huge beast. Um, it's easy to get caught up in there but if some of the settings haven't been um you know the spam one you're alluding to um can be as simple as their tick box they got a little tick box in admin for that but also um you might need to spend ages excluding sites especially some of those spam seo ones that uh, generate loads of referral links so yeah uh, one Actually, well, yeah go on can i jump on that real yeah quick? go on I just went to what most consider is the largest SEO conference in, in the world. Um, and at this conference, uh, three different Google executives spoke and most interestingly, they recommended to not worry about 
those spam links that are coming to your site. And so you don't want to build them. And if they're hurting you, if they're toxic, you definitely want to disavow them, which you can do in Search Console. However, they made a very big point to not worry as much as in the past we were worried about it. So you definitely don't want to have toxic links. Um, I can tell you stories about agencies that have built toxic links. Um, I have a very funny one, but I don't want to necessarily cross that bridge where an agency had posted them to a uh, very different type of website that wasn't in their industry to build links. So you want to be careful of where your brand is mentioned and where it is found. But I wouldn't worry too much about those toxic links. I would just say be careful of of the authority score, like we talked about before, what is the authority of the site that you're trying to get linking to you? So I didn't want to step on you there, but I wanted to make sure that people knew that this is kind of a new deal. It's, it's a little more cutting edge to understand those important things because, and you kind of alluded to this, SEO is a fast paced changing world. And while someone could be good at it right now, I tell business owners, roofers, contractors, uh, whoever, whatever industry you're in, you didn't start your company thinking, Hey man, I'm great at marketing. I'm great at SEO. Let me start putting roofs on houses. Like that's not why you started your company. You started your company because you thought, Hey, I am good at this. I'm going to start a company. And then marketing kind of kind of has to happen so that you continue to grow that business. So that's where you kind of want to be careful of like, what are the new strategies? And even though you feel like you're good at SEO, uh, are you keeping up with the trends and the current information? And that's also where you can see results quickly, uh, where people are, one agency would focus on, let's go disavow all these links while another agency may be more successful by focusing on your content first. But that's going to go to information, strategy, and experience along with knowledge of the most current trends and what's cutting edge right now. Yes. I mean, when businesses have got a finite budget, allocating that budget can be a bit of a, a bit of a challenge on the marketing side as well. Um, You know, as you said earlier, the, Really, all the business owner is interested in is generating leads. If you're an e-commerce site, you're interested in sales. But at the end of the day, all the marketing company is going to provide is leads to the website. You're the one that's got to convert them um, on the on the e-commerce site. So so you're generating you're generating leads. So how do you balance out that um, that, that that finite budget over, say, paid ads email and seo because i mean again seo is is just another one that's really hard to or can be hard to quantify uh, you know return on investment Uh, whereas ads is could we say a lot simpler you know click on an ad did it sell did it did it generate a lead no zero return on investment yes 100 percent return on investment whereas seo could be a little bit more spooky around the edges Yeah. So again, I I love the conversation and this right there, everything you just said is exactly why I have opened up uh, a new business uh, a a little bit outside of the agency that I have built over 10 years. Um, And that's why I moved to the fractional chief marketing officer because of what you just said, which is how do you track it? How do you know from an unbiased point of view what you're really getting. Because if you go to an agency and you say, hey, how am I doing? They're going to tell you whatever numbers that they have, but they're not looking at the big picture of the company of where are you allocating budget? What's your best ROI? And I'm going to come back to that in a minute of a strategy. But let me answer real quick the e-commerce because you said that several times. In analytics, you can set up what's called funnel visualization. And I did this for a company. This was about six years ago. And we were running funnel visualization. We came back within three months and we identified that we had a huge drop off on a specific page. We couldn't quite figure out why. So we quickly went to that page and looked at it. And we thought as a consumer, what would a consumer think, feel and see? What's their experience, also known as UX? What's their experience when they come to the site? And we looked at this site and immediately we made a fist and punched ourselves in the face. 
because we didn't have a buy now button on one of our product pages. So they had to three times click on a product to actually purchase rather than one to two clicks. We made it much harder on ourselves. Thus, we had a high exit rate because people were educated on the product but weren't buying. We made that slight change after we had a bloody nose and a black eye beating ourselves up. And boom, immediately volume went up. So knowing that sometimes with an agency, they know that if they're really, really good at e-commerce, but again, that can fall through the wayside, even for the best companies. So having a fractional CMO that's looking at your big picture, that's one of the reasons why. Now, I want to kind of go back to a broad stroke of when we've talked a lot about how to hire an agency, what to look for, how to achieve better results. I created a program 10 years ago because I was driving from Washington, D.C. after teaching a conference back to Dallas, where I currently live. And it kind of hit me in the forehead of, man, I really wish I could show people what I do and how I do it and how effective I am. And I came up with a program that I still run from time to time that I call test before you invest. And it essentially becomes a strategy of work with someone on a short basis to identify and set goals and see how well they achieve those goals in a 30 or 60 day span. And don't commit to them for a year or two or five years like some agencies want you to do. They tell you, well, you can't achieve anything in six months. Maybe I can't achieve anything, but I can for sure know if they're doing their job or not in six months. And that's why I use a program called Test Before You Invest. Now, in today's age, um, no matter what program you work in, I don't do long term contracts like most agencies simply because if I'm not doing a good job, I want to be fired. You know, I'm proud of of one uh, many things, but one specific, I'm extremely proud that over all the years of me working online and digital marketing, I don't have one negative comment out there on the World Wide web. You can search as much as you want, but it is extremely rare that you don't have a negative comment working in the world I do. And part of that is I've refunded money when I haven't done a good job and I do short-term programs. If you don't feel like I'm doing a good job, fire me. Now, I share this primarily so that the expectation is set by anyone listening to this podcast. They understand what is out there. What options does that small business owner have? Do they have to commit to one year and pray you know, every night on bended knee until their knees are bloody that something's going to work and they have another six months to go and they're not getting anything from it? The answer is no. There's not a lot of agencies that do what I do as far as short term or 30 day contracts, but they are out there. You just have to look for them, find them, you know, test them, set up your goals and everything else we've been talking about, which has been, a, in my opinion, a great conversation for business owners to know this information, for them to identify, hey, there, there's some better options out there rather than just getting stuck with the average Joe and, and feeling like they're getting, you know, I hope this is OK word or you can bleep it out, other than knowing that they're getting screwed by some other agency, you know, don't, don't get screwed by what they're doing. You know, that's uh, that's kind of the deal. The other thing, let me follow up and finish out with answering your question. Tracking as a fractional CMO or even a business owner doing this yourself, set up a CRM and a CRM will allow you to load in leads and track them from lead source. And if you can't pay for a CRM, there are some free ones out there, but if you don't want to pay for it, if it's too complex, start an Excel spreadsheet. And a lot of times you can do that through what most people use QuickBooks. Most people have QuickBooks and you can track your leads through QuickBooks, export your Excel spreadsheet, and then identify how much money did I spend this year or month or six months on this specific campaign and how many leads came from it. Uh, but be careful, one asterisk as I turn the mic back over to you. One asterisk there is you, at, with your website and your online presence, you are paying for an online business card. 
People that even know you don't just count, okay, well, I had X sales or X visitors, so I'm going to count that towards it, but the payoff wasn't high enough. Keep in mind that a good website, a clean, clear, crisp, high-level looking and functioning website is extremely important, and you need to allocate and earmark part of your budget that you're paying an ad agency to. Earmark part of that percentage. And I would typically say 20 to 30 percent you should allocate as a general footer of I've got a good website. It's fast. It's clean. It works. And people like it, um, you know, to identify that. So, God, crikey, there was a lot in there. <laughs> so to come back on, on some of that stuff, I mean, the first one is uh, what you alluded to was conversion rate optimization. I mean, I'm absolutely a big fan of that. Um, cause if you can increase your conversion rate by 10%, I mean, that's, that's saved ad, ad money, whether it be organic or otherwise, um, better experience leads to higher conversions. CRMs, um, you might not think if you run an e-commerce site that you need a CRM, but there's CRMs like Infusionsoft out there that work well with small businesses and e-commerce sites. They're really cool. Free ones, Zoho, do a starter one for free. HubSpot. Uh, now got a free for life CRM. If you don't know HubSpot, they're an inbound or used to be known as an inbound marketing agency. They're pretty cool. Uh, their top end stuff is something like $800 a month. So free CRM off of them uh, is, is something. Um, God, there was, there was just so much in there. <laughs> where, to, where, 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 to, where to dive and delve first. But I, I suppose it's on the, it's, a, it's coming off of the CRM thing. Because we say about generating leads. Now, I, you know, I've worked with clients on on this before. We generate the lead. Inquiry goes to them. Uh, and, and they say, well, we don't get any sales. <laughs> but the most important part of the lead generation system is the follow up afterwards. I mean, what... You know, have you put any systems in place? What do you encourage in terms of the business owners in terms of their follow up process? Yeah. So again, I love the path here. Sorry that I gave you so much info. I'll try to shorten my answers for you. Be, be a little more precise on it. But, but yeah, so I created, you talked in, and spoke about in the very beginning, some programs and uh, coded programs that I've built over the years. One of them that I built is called Fireproof Follow-Up. And essentially, it's meant to help the business owner because business owners go through waves. You work hard, you generate a lot of leads, you work on the sales, you work on the fulfillment. And while you're working on the fulfillment, all of a sudden your leads go down because you haven't focused on following up and dealing with it. So I created Fireproof Follow-Up because we need to keep a mainstream flow. So you also alluded to I built a CRM. This is, you know, the, the, just so people have an idea for a hundred dollars, I have a CRM and fireproof follow-up and they work together. And the reason I built these two is because you have the brain, which is the CRM. And then you have the mechanism that follows up with the leads as the fireproof follow-up. So setting up a system and there are other programs out there. So I'm only going to speak to what I've done and what I've built. Okay. So take that with a grain of salt, but uh, the fireproof follow-up program allows you to set up uh, marketing specifically to certain leads and it does it over a period of time. So you can set it up to run every eight days, every two days, uh, whatever you want it to do over whatever period of time. And you can set it to do a postcard. You can set it to do uh, some other type of mail or a box or a present type box or even an email. And the nice thing about a program like that is essentially you're just saying in front of the customer, you're, you're building your brand at a very low conversion rate. And as you build that, that brand, it can help be top of mind. You know, I, I sometimes get emails that I talked to someone eight months ago, wasn't really ready to do anything with them. But in eight months, I got three emails in that third email. I go, wow, yeah, I wanted to talk to that guy. I didn't have time eight months ago. It wasn't something top of mind, but now it is. 
where people make mistakes is that they they feel like they need to blow someone's email up for every month, three times a month or two times a month. And that's a mistake because then people opt out. And when they opt out, you lose your opportunity in eight months when they do want to talk to you. So I prefer to scale that back and maybe once every two months or once every three months, because when you do that over a long period of time, they're going to run into times and you're going to get that right time, right place option where people go, oh, yeah, I was looking for that. And they can then contact you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I'm a really big fan of is is remarketing as well. So for those that are not familiar, you drive someone to your website, they're not ready to buy or inquire. Um, and, uh, you know, with their permission nowadays, um, you drop a little cookie and it follows them around the web and you can then show them ads on on certain sites. You know, Facebook do it, LinkedIn allow you to do it, even Twitter. And of course, Google do. And it's a, it's a lovely, lovely soft approach. Um, but you talked about physical stuff there so your system's actually built into sending uh physical mail postcards and and gifts yeah let me just touch on the retargeting make sure that you're paying attention to the time frame of the buyer yes. educational spectrums is when they identify what you have and when they're actually going to purchase so a plumber it's like a 24 hour turnaround right so a pest control is probably like a 24 to 48 turnaround uh, but buying a car oftentimes is like a two to three month. Um, buying a house can sometimes be a year or two years. So, you know, keep in mind what that educational spectrum is. But, yeah, going back to the fireproof follow up strategy, um, quick story. I had a pest control company come to me uh, in 2012 and they wanted to target a specific group of people and they wanted to stay in front of them. They wanted to market to them and get their attention and let them know who they were. So we started off by sending a postcard and this program did this automatically. But by getting a postcard, we were looking for bounce back, wrong addresses, wrong people, return to sender. Uh, and we did it as cheap as possible to send out a postcard just to see if it worked or not. The next step, we sent out a little bit more comprehensive mail piece uh, that we knew would actually land in the uh, prospect's lap. Uh, the problem that we know oftentimes can happen is they throw it away. But what we've now achieved is we've helped them identify their brand. What is their brand? Who, who are we as a company that is trying to sell to you? Then we, again, this is where your strategy can change. So I'm going to fast forward some of this. We ended up sending them a box. And with this specific strategy, we took a six inch roach and a six inch plastic rat. And we painted our logo on the roach along with our phone number. And we mailed this to people with a postcard. And when we sent this out, we knew what our ROI was. So we had set specifically what we're going to spend on the entire campaign. What's the dropout rate? How many people are we going to send the box to? Are they qualified? So we figured all this information out. We knew we needed one new client to break even. And anything above one client, we knew we made money. Okay. So when we hit that box, we started with 150. We ended up sending out... Uh, 20 boxes. And when we sent that box out immediately within 24 hours of that box landing, we had eight phone calls. We ended up closing in the end of the entire campaign. We ended up closing 12 new accounts. So the ROI was tremendous. Now keep in mind the next year, the business owner said that he knew better. So he wanted to put in a jump drive into the box. We sold zero. Yeah. It was a complete yeah. flop. So just the strategy, the little pieces of mailing these items out can be extremely effective, but you can't just waste money. You have to have a specific plan. You have to have a specific uh, modification to your plan of knowing what your leverage points are. What are, are we hitting the pain points? A lot of little details go into that, but it was a sp spectacular campaign. Uh, the next best campaign we did for him was in year three. And again, this was pest control. 
we wanted to advertise bed bugs. So we put a plastic Ziploc bag and a note in the Ziploc. And it said, caution, live bed bugs so you know what they look like. Then we ripped off a corner of the Ziploc bag by hand so it looked like it was torn. And they had, so it looked like they escaped. And people called us and were just blowing us up, like just freaking out. And we told them, like, hey, it was a joke, but we did it on purpose just to get you on the phone. We sold several accounts off of that. We probably uh, kind of picked off a few people. But you know what? That's part of marketing. Is uh, I talk about a, a scenario called interrupt, engage, educate, and offer. And your interrupt has got to break through the clutter of the marketing. You know, if you're driving down the street, can you name all the billboards that you pass on your way to work every day? Oftentimes you can't because there's there's so much clutter in the marketplace that we don't pay attention to it being interrupted by something. Uh, the engagement becomes even harder because now we have to show them why there's value in talking to us. Once they find that value, the education is what most people jump to. Hey, be educated about my product. So they over talk, over hype their product uh, and they use platitudes to do that. And then we have to move to an easy to handle offer. What's easy that I can get involved with to test this product out to know if it really does fit and do what you said. And and that's the four steps to the, to buying uh, any product and marketing your product. No, I love the, I love the bed bugs <laughs> tactic. Um, <laughs> it's just brilliant. I mean, the postal service would have been on your back um, quite literally if uh, if you had been sending live bed bugs. I'm sure through the post service, they would have, they would have liked yeah, that too much. Don't, don't actually send bugs in the mail. <laughs> no. I mean, the nearest we got to that was involved in a campaign uh, where the end point was uh, sending toilet rolls out to, uh, <laughs> to, to to people, and that 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 went down um, that went down quite well. That got got a good laugh but it, but like you say it's causing that interruption um and that deviation and it's surprising really how well off um offline tactics can still work if they're thought through um if they're thought through in that way they can really really still work now josh you you've got a book should we talk a bit about, about your book yeah so I uh, just published this book and it's the title of it is how some SEO companies disguise laziness and hide poor strategies. So it's a step to step guide on winning online. Uh, there's about 15 chapters in it. And some of them talk about a lot about what we've been talking about, how to write your marketing, that educational spectrum. Um, you know, there's a lot of different chapters in here that, that cover writing content, uh, marketing tools and how to track SEO, um, you know, brain based marketing, how to identify the user experience and write content for a good uh, for good SEO growth um, and, and a lot more. Like I said, there's about 15 chapters to the book that, that cover all different types of marketing. OK, is that, is that book available online? It's available on my website okay. uh, for just a couple of bucks. And if people hear your podcast and, and reach out to me uh, and mention your, your podcast, be happy to mail them a hard copy book for free. Oh, that's, that, that's absolutely awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what, what are the benefits they're going to get from the, from the book? Are they going to understand in, in more depth some of the things that we've spoken about today? Yeah, they're going to understand. You know, I start off the whole book by talking about how to identify – um, how to hire the right ad agency and hold them accountable. Yeah. So that's where the book starts. They'll learn how to actually write content that follows the step-to-step -step path of interrupt and engage audience uh, to generate more leads so that audience members understand what they're reading and why they're reading it very quickly. Um, so there's, they would literally, I believe, if they followed and read through the 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 chapters, they're going to be able to write content better, hold agencies accountable, identify what SEO really is, how it should work. Um, and they would really ultimately be able to write their own marketing plan at a base level so that at least a small business owner could have a better, well thought out marketing plan put together to uh, achieve better results. 
fantastic so if they if they're interested in that where where, where should they go they can go to my website. Yep. It's called jrcmo.com. So Josh Ramsey, but it's jrcmo.com. And there's uh, some of my tools that I have spoken to. We're going to be launching uh, some additional tools in the next few months. Um, there's the SEO library that you and I spoke to, uh, that library is there so people can identify every element, every core element of SEO. Um, and they can get the book and there's also free chapters that they can download on the website. So if they just want to pick up one specific chapter, then they can uh, flip through the site and then they can learn a little bit more. We're, we're publishing blogs all the time so they can read a lot of additional content on the site. And do you have any availability at the moment if people want to speak to you in more depth? Absolutely. Uh, You can actually grab my cell phone from my website and you can text me. Um, And, you know, I make time. I carve out time. I work a lot of hours, (laughs) but I, I love what I do. I enjoy what I do. My kids like to tell me, you know, Daddy, stay at home more. Uh, I travel and speak at a lot of engagements and, um, you know, I, right now where it is, is, uh, I do have time. I do have blocks of time available and coaching programs available, um, for people looking for an ad agency, you can reach out, uh, to my ad agency directly, uh, to get faster information. That company is strategic point marketing.com. So you can reach out to them and and speak with them. Uh, Or again, you can text me and ask me some questions. I'm happy to do the best I can to answer. Texting me is going to get a faster response. But again, I'd I'd really love for them to mention this podcast so that I can can call you back and say, hey, you know. It worked. (laughs) No, text is a good idea. It avoids the spam box, doesn't it? (laughs) <laughs> texting yes, yeah. straight in but they can email me from the website there's a lot of different ways i make myself pretty available you know i have a facebook page as well so that they can reach out that way so i make myself pretty available i i love talking to people i've found that the the best ceos the best entrepreneurs and the the most brilliant minds make themselves available to the public you just have to look for them um but people like mark cuban uh, he reads you know, 95% of his emails that come through, if they go to spam, they go to spam and it takes some time to go through them. But, you know, uh, some brilliant minds, when you have their email address and you find and dig up how to contact them, they respond. So again, I, I like to pattern myself after successful people. Um, you know, there's not a reinvention of the wheel when it comes to success. It's number one, hard work. And then after that, it, it becomes the elements of what hard work looks like. absolutely and we'll put all links to all of those resources in the show notes um make sure you've got a link to the website to the book area and and to the agency for josh that's brilliant thank you ever so much josh i mean that was really insightful it was a great chat um it was almost a fireside chat really <laughs> talking about yeah, talking no, about I that appreciate stuff you having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> no it's, it's really really good and thanks a lot guys for listening um i hope you get some benefit from there some lovely little gems in there and obviously some great resources nip over to uh, josh's website grab a copy of the book uh, individual chapters if you like um and if you've got any questions as josh says you just just text him and ask um absolutely brilliant a little ask from me if anyone's been listening to the show for any length of time uh, you will know that uh, come next april i will be doing a silly run across the sahara desert six days uh, five marathons back to back carrying my own gear getting very hot uh, i'm very tired and actually i'll be offline for the whole week um so uh, you you won't be able to contact me um but if you're interested in what i'm doing if you'd like to support the cause um we are supporting uh veterans um uh, ex-military personnel who are finding it hard difficult to get back into work after after leaving the services um then please nip over to mdspodcast.com where you can hear some of the stories um i interview some of the participants that are taking part with us next year and uh the latest one is awesome a guy called duncan slater double amputee he's done the marathon de sables two times already um 
Uh, absolutely awesome, awesome guy. He talks about his experience and everything. So please nip over to mdspodcast.com. Listen to the show. If you feel inclined, then um, donations uh, are accepted, uh, gratefully accepted. Uh, if you can't afford a donation, just share the link. Um, ap- uh, you'll be absolutely uh, grateful of that. And for this show, this show uh, lives on love. Uh, just any uh, any reviews you'd like to leave on any of the platforms we're on itunes spotify google podcasts these stitcher if it still exists yeah it does still exist um you'll find us everywhere so please guys uh leave a review thanks for listening until next time thank you very much for listening cheers bye you have been listening to the Click and Convert podcast. Don't miss a show. Subscribe for free on iTunes at clickandconvert.co forward slash iTunes. We'd like to thank our show sponsor, Optio. Optio is a Google Ads management tool and much more. If you run one Google Ads account or 100, Optio will save you time and enhance your ad management skills. Smart, powerful and built to make life easier. It will automate routine Google Ads tasks and alert you automatically to trends and even make automatic recommendations. You can then spend more time on high level strategy and creative work. We use Optio in our agency to make us more efficient and effective. Go to optio.com forward slash click and convert to claim your six week free trial. That's optio.com forward slash click and convert to claim your six week free trial.